So, um, Nord Frobbins uh, is a strange name uh, because it comes from the names of two men who started the approach. Paul Nordhoff was a composer and a pianist, very much from the classical tradition in the United States. Um, Clive Robbins was a teacher of children with special needs in England um, and he'd worked primarily in the anthroposophical Steiner tradition uh, in, residential, in a residential school near Birmingham. Um, they met and they put their ideas together um, and Paul Norder found himself using all of his musicianship, not with these highly uh, musically talented um, future pianists that he'd been teaching before, but with the children that Clive Robbins had been teaching, who were children with learning difficulties, with delayed development, with autism. Um, and he was working with them as musicians and working with them in a musical way. So he wasn't trying to treat them with music, but he was trying to engage them as his fellow musician. Um, and Clive Robbins, who knew these children well, uh, was able to see that these children kind of did more than anyone expected them to be able to do, um, showed a real capacity and ability um, that tended to get neglected outside the realm of music making. Um, essentially, it's, it's a musical way of thinking and of being with another person. It's not using music as some kind of pill. Um, it's not imagining that music is the answer to everyone's problems or a magical um, a magical kind of thing that just transforms people in some way. But rather it's paying attention to what happens when two people make music together and in particular to how one person can enable another person to enter into musical experience. Um, especially where that goes beyond what people might generally expect. Um, so Nordoff and Robbins worked with children. They worked entirely with children, um, most of whom had developmental delay or learning difficulties or um, sort of genetically caused syndromes of one kind or another. We now work with people across the life range. Um, so we work with that population, but we also work, for example, with people who are experiencing dementia towards the end of their life. Uh, we also work with people who've had brain injuries um, and are struggling to kind of re find out how to use their bodies in an intentional way again. Um, and there's something about music itself that draws people into music making and enables them to participate in it. Um, most people don't need help with that, so most people don't need music therapy, but there are situations in life where it really helps to be given a hand into it and to be helped to keep going in it and also help to get satisfying experiences out of it. And I think that's the role of the music therapist in the North Robbins tradition, really. Um, we always start from seeing what someone is already doing. So many people, um, even if most of the world says, oh, that child is just screaming. And Nord of Robbins music therapist would hear it musically. They'd think about the timbre and the intensity and the kind of um, tone, tonality of it and try and respond to it in that musical kind of way so that there's a chance of it developing. And that means that the child's experience of what they're doing develops as well. But the The world around is not experienced as hostile and strange but is experienced as collaborative and um, on your side to some extent. Okay, so I'm going to play uh, an example of music therapy in action in a school. Um, this is a young lady called Mary and she's working with a music therapist called Antonia. Um, and Mary is in a wheelchair. Um, she can't move her body below her waist. Um, you'll see that she's um, moving her arms and her head and so Tony's really focusing on this on what she can do rather, rather than what she can't do. Mary doesn't have any language um, and she's highly dependent on staff around her at school and of course her parents at home. 
Um, and that means that she has a certain kind of interaction with parents. It's quite a dependent uh, relationship. You know, she needs to be fed and clothed and changed and all that kind of stuff. But here, the music offers her an opportunity to take a slightly different role. So what we see is Antonia realising that Mary is in effect um, telling her what to do. Uh, and she's doing it partly very physically by taking Antonia's hand and moving it um, and partly very um, artistically really in her movements and I'm not sure how much of that is intentional at the beginning but the intentionality clearly grows as as the music making develops. <laughs> could say anybody could sit with Mary and just move like that of course they could um, but it doesn't happen very often that someone just sits and moves with another person the music gives you both a structure for doing it and a reason for doing it as well so that there's a sense of going somewhere there's a sense of harmonic direction and of course she's also using her voice she's joining up the big hits with a thread of her voice so it's a the melody keeps us going. There's a sense we haven't finished yet. We haven't finished yet. Let's do another one, keep going. Here's the finish, you know. So this is an extract. Uh, I thought I'd show someone young and someone older. So this is a gentleman who um, is accessing the services of music therapy in a hospice. Um, uh, and um, this person has uh, early stage dementia um, he lives at home and he's looked after by his wife. Um, this is a man who clearly loves music. Uh, he knows a lot of music and he's quite um, um, careful and particular, I would say, about the way in which he plays. So um, he's sitting at a drum kit uh, and um, he's trying it out. His head is down, he looks mostly involved in the instruments. Um, and bearing in mind this is uh, nearly Christmas time, you probably recognise a Christmas themed tune which gets adapted by Fraser um, to his playing. So you can't see Fraser because he's off camera, but at the moment when uh, this gentleman recognises what's going on, he looks straight to Fraser. So you can tell where Fraser is. And again, it's a really clear example of how here I am with an instrument, what do I do with this? It turns into, ooh, you and me are doing this music making together. And again, a bit like Mary, it reverses the usual roles. So it puts this gentleman in a position where he's actually directing. In fact, I'd call it conducting, actually, because he stops really playing and starts being in charge of the music. Um, and Fraser is able to respond to this in a very clear way 
so that, you know, there is no doubt that this man is conducting and that Fraser is being responsive to it. But there's also a kind of humour about it that, that fuels it. And there's also a kind of, um, um, there's a real quality, a real kind of aesthetic quality to Fraser's playing that I think makes this very satisfying. And otherwise it wouldn't have lasted very long. Clearly, you know, this is someone who's struggling with the onset of dementia, but, you know, he's still this amazingly creative, imaginative, responsive, interactive person. And, you know, he just absolutely comes alive in this kind of, ooh, something musical is happening here kind of moment. And, you know, that really is dependent on Fraser's ability to, to, um, to, to well, to play his role in it too so that it goes somewhere it's not just oh this is fun playing the drum it's like oh there's a sense of development and um, this is possible whether you have dementia or not and it's almost like a human right i think this idea that you know we're not here to treat people when he's not going to become um slower in the onset of dementia because of this but he's going to take pleasure he's going to access the pleasure that comes from making music with another person he's going to experience him himself as a musician in this and i think this is something that you know most people can access for themselves when they need to but sometimes people need help and those people are the people who tend to get socially neglected in terms of the arts and music especially so that's probably true of most of the people we work with whether it's children with learning difficulties adults with learning difficulties people who've had brain injuries 
um, you know, people with uh, severe mental health problems, people with dementia, you know, these people are not considered priorities for the arts. But actually, these are the people who who get most out of the arts when they're offered in a way that's really tailored to them. So that's what we're here for.